So, you'll probably recognize this. Maybe you've been lucky enough to witness it. But the Northern Lights, or Aurora Borealis, are more than just a beautiful phenomenon. They are also a sign of something else going on, something potentially more sinister, something possibly very damaging. The Northern Lights are just one part of space weather, something we take very seriously here at the Met Office. And that's what this video is all about. We'll be looking at weather from beyond planet Earth and asking, just how do we go about extraterrestrial meteorology? First up though, let's deal with the Aurora. Now, to understand the Northern Lights, we need to start over 90 million miles away on the surface of the Sun. Our closest star always seems pretty constant, doesn't it? It's always there rising and setting every day. But the Sun's surface is fascinating and constantly changing, bubbling with plasma, gases and particles. And when this frothing gets especially lively, it can send plasma out into space in something called a coronal mass ejection. Coronal mass ejections, or CMEs for short, are when lots of high energy charged particles are released by the sun. They are spewed out, sending them traveling through our solar system. Now, frequently, the CMEs have no interaction with us here on Earth at all, simply moving away harmlessly through space or sometimes interacting with other planets. However, when this plasma does connect with Earth, it enlivens our upper atmosphere in a dramatic way, creating a storm in the Earth's magnetosphere. What's that? Well, the Earth, along with many celestial bodies, planets and stars, has a natural magnetic field surrounding it. And it's here where charged particles are interacting with the magnetic field. That's what we call the magnetosphere. Now, it's several hundred kilometers above the Earth's surface. It's always there, and it's actually very good and useful at protecting us from the most damaging effects of the sun. When the plasma from a CME hits our magnetosphere, well, that's when the magic happens. High energy particles from the sun collide with low energy particles meandering around high in our magnetosphere. These particles then become energized or excited from the collision and to calm down again, well, they have to lose that energy. And they do that by emitting light. That's what you're seeing. That's the interaction behind the Northern Lights. When billions of charged particles reach Earth from a CME, they can create dazzling displays of light in the atmosphere. The specific colors that can be seen, well, they're dictated by the type of gas in the atmosphere that gets hit and how high up in the sky the collision occurs. Greens, for example, well, they're produced by oxygen at lower altitudes. This is the most common form of aurora light and the most easily seen as the human eye is more sensitive to green. Red is a bit rarer, but it's also produced by oxygen, but higher up in the sky. And blue and purple colors, well, they're produced by nitrogen. So when you're seeing the display of lights in the sky, what you're really witnessing is the arrival of charged particles from the sun as they smash into particles very high in the Earth's atmosphere. Now, when this light show happens in the Northern Hemisphere, it's called the Northern Lights or Aurora Borealis. But when it happens in the Southern Hemisphere, it's called the Aurora Australis or Southern Lights. Waking up to hundreds of pictures on your social media of the Northern Lights can be a bit demoralizing if you've gone to bed early. In order to see the Aurora, a few things need to be in place for us here in the UK. Firstly, we need an event that is powerful enough to bring the auroras to the UK. Now, as a general rule, the stronger the interaction between the Earth's particles and the CME, the further south it can be seen. During one famous occurrence, known as the Carrington event in 1859, the aurora was so heavily charged, it was seen as far south as the Caribbean. But that was an exception, a highly unusual and extreme example. It still takes quite a strong event for the aurora to be visible in southern England, but it does happen. 
weaker events are far more common, and as a result, the Northern Lights are a fairly regular visitor to Northern Scotland. Next, you're going to need it to occur at the right time, that is, of course, at night. Coronal mass ejections do often reach the Earth during the day, but without the fanfare of visible auroras, as it's simply too light to see them. And this is why some people think that auroras are more common in winter, when the reality is it's just that there's a bigger window of opportunity due to the long nights. So, you've got a big enough event to bring the auroras near you, and it's happening at night, but there's still a few more things that you can do to maximise your chances of actually seeing them. It's important to get away from light pollution. So that means away from big cities. Much better to be in the countryside so that you can see the full effect. Also, make sure to face north, where you're much more likely to catch a glimpse, especially if you're further south in the UK. It can really help if you have a good view of the northern horizon. Oh, and of course, you'll be needing the weather to be on your side, with little clouds and uh, good visibility. If you think you can see something lighting the skies, but it's not looking spectacular, perhaps just a, a faint green glow, then it's a good idea to get your camera out. Taking a long exposure shot using your camera can often reveal more of the auroras above you. So if it feels like your eyes are deceiving you, then reach for your camera. And uh, if you do get a good snap, remember to send pictures to us on social media using the hashtag LoveUKWeather, as we love seeing them, and we often share them. As I mentioned at the start, the auroras are just one part of the impacts of what's called space weather. Now, this is very different from the weather we forecast for you every day using maps and graphics. The weather we experience on Earth is caused by our atmosphere. And yes, in part, that is driven by the warmth of the sun and how that changes with night and day and across different latitudes. But space weather looks beyond this, at the more direct influence the sun can have by literally sending stuff towards us. Let's take a look at some of the different types of space weather. We've already discussed coronal mass ejections, which are bursts of plasma from the sun which get released into space, and if they hit the Earth's magnetic field, they can cause geomagnetic storms and auroras. Solar radiation storms occur when the sun emits high-energy particles, primarily protons, which travel through space at high speeds. Now, these particles can then collide with objects like satellites, and this can cause disruption to all kinds of modern-day life that depend on these satellites, and can also sometimes penetrate deep into the Earth's atmosphere, particularly near the poles. Then there's solar flares. These are intense bursts of electromagnetic radiation from the sun's surface. Now, they often occur at the same time as other space weather phenomena, like coronal mass ejections. However, solar flares travel at the speed of light, so arrive at the Earth around eight minutes after they occur, which is much quicker than a CME, which can take several hours or even a few days to reach us. So, there's lots of different types of space weather, some of which can cause aurora. But why else is it important to forecast these events? And how exactly are they forecast? Well, luckily, we have a world-renowned team dedicated to space weather forecasting right here at the Met Office. Here at the Met Office Space Weather Operations Centre, or MOSWALK for short, and our space weather forecasters are monitoring the sun 24-7 for signs of activity that may lead to significant space weather here on Earth, where we can then provide forecasts for governments and key infrastructure providers. Why do we even need to forecast space weather? Well, for most people, their experience of space weather comes from viewing the aurora, the northern lights. There is actually a more significant impact from severe space weather. So when we see more significant space weather, it can have an impact on us here on Earth, on our technology, on our communication systems, and our ground-based infrastructure. And can you give some examples of when space weather's really had significant impacts across the globe? Yeah, whilst day-to-day -day, most space weather is benign, like the weather that we experience day-to-day -day in meteorology, it doesn't cause much impact. It is the most significant types of space weather that we can see significant impacts from. Historically, we have seen disruptions to power grids, um, 
but in parts of the globe. We've seen communications which systems being disrupted, such as high frequency communications, satellite systems, and it can cause issues for satellite operators, maintaining orbit and so on. And how do you go about forecasting space weather? Compared to terrestrial meteorology, we don't have a great deal of observations. We have a handful of satellites which are trained on the sun, as well as some ground-based monitoring capabilities, so we can really see what the impacts are when it arrives on Earth. Our first stage is to look for signs of sunspot activities. These are dark spots on the sun. Uh, darker, they're darker because they're cooler than the surroundings. This is where we see tightly bound magnetic field, which essentially just means that the sun is more unstable there. And there's the potential that it could be releasing energy, which is known as solar flares or coronal mass ejections, these enormous eruptions of plasma. We're looking out for the signs that this might be happening because this could lead to significant space weather. Most people's experience of space weather is, is through the aurora. Talk us through how you go about forecasting that. When we see these eruptions from the sun, these coronal mass ejections, it's releasing these enormous bursts of plasma into space charged particles. We can see this actually happening through satellite images as it leaves the sun. And by doing some calculations, we can establish how fast these plasma bubbles are moving, whether they're likely to arrive on Earth, and if they are, what time they're due to arrive. And it's from this that we can give an indication that you may see the aurora, but also if we're looking at a more significant space weather event, we can then provide forecasts for government, infrastructure providers, satellite operators to let them know that there are some risks from this particular event. We're surrounded by lots of incredible pictures. It's, it's the most beautiful part of the Met Office in my opinion with that gorgeous array we can see behind you of those images. Talk us through what we're actually looking at there. In some of these images, what we can see initially are the sunspots. We can see the size and the complexity of these. These are viewed as darker spots on the sun compared to the surrounding area. This is because they're more magnetically complex. So we can look at the size, we can look at the complexity to get an indication as to whether we're likely to see some solar flares. Then some of the satellite imagery is in different wavelengths and from this we can pick up different key features on the sun. So we can see solar flares much clearer in some, in some wavelengths. We can look for areas known as coronal holes where we can expect faster solar winds with other wavelengths as well. Some imagery as well we use to identify these coronal mass ejections as they leave the sun. We see these as eruptions coming away from the sun. This image, it blocks out much of the light from the sun, so that all we see is the outer layer of the sun, the corona, and this lets us quite clearly see if we're expecting one of these, uh, one of these solar storms to arrive at Earth. We've seen all sides of space weather here, the beautiful auroras that it can cause, but also a look into the impacts space weather can bring here on Earth, as well as how it's forecast. Remember, you can also access the space weather forecast through the Met Office website. And if you've enjoyed this video, and want to hear more about space weather, well, let us know in the comments what questions you might have and explore our animations on space weather types here.